tie and uh, I've got an orange shirt on. I think Aaron has a photo of me tonight because we were having some technical difficulties. Um, my my uh, voice is breaking as if I'm like a 13 year old boy, which at 13, I wanted to be a 13 year old boy. So it all works out. Um, anyway, this is what happens when you ask a poet to tell a story. Uh, everything, everything goes wrong. What an amazing night of people. Um, gosh, I'm so grateful to be here. Um, thinking about the edge of reason as I sit here and my connection is off and all this and that. Um, I have to say all day long, I have been saying to my partner, uh, Angeline, who I could show you if I could, if you could see me, but you can't see me. Um, uh, I keep, keep saying, I, I have to cancel. I, I don't have the bandwidth for this. It's too hard. Um, so much is like coming at me all the time. And I, I mean, how does one tell a story? I, I'm a poet, so I could, you know, maybe I could tell them, um, like 400, uh, examples of things that I smelled today or, uh, 50 things that I touched today, make a list that's somehow a poem. Um, but the idea of, of having something that feels cohesive was really hard for me because even on my best days, like I've tried to be a novelist. And basically what that means is like, I write like a page and a half and then it ends. Um, so even on my best days, like it's, it's super hard for me to think about putting something together, but particularly right now, um, like I, I said to my partner today, I said, those prose writers, they're like professional athletes, you know? Um, whereas like today I professionally ate, um, I think I ate two homemade English muffins. And then I said to my partner that I feel like super tired. Um, and Angeline made the muffins. I didn't make the muffins. She taught Pilates online today too. She also uh, drew plans for our cedar garden beds. Um, she did the research needed to figure out how to buy them in the time of a pandemic. Uh, and also listened to me talk like super calmly uh, and with a lot of authority about how I probably uh, was just gonna cancel tonight. I just couldn't do it. And I feel like being the spouse of a poet is a little bit like being like the general manager of a professional athletic team, like like the Red Sox like in 1986 or 1975. Uh, if you don't if you don't know what that feels like to be a Red Sox fan in 1986 or 75, then uh, you're lucky. It's great. Um, anyway, all day I've been saying I I just can't do it. I can't tell a story or make sense of it or just. Uh, all day and every day since this pandemic started, I just keep thinking how weird it is to like have so many different things happening. Um, so much new suffering related to the illness, so much like continued and just like endless injustice related to police brutality and white supremacy and all the hope of the protests that we see, all the change and all the stasis just uh, washing over me all the time. And all I want to do, I find, I don't know if other people feel this, is I just like want to put my hand on a stranger. Like I just want to um, hug my friends and their kids, my friend Jen and her sons, Hank and Desmond. I want to feel uh, my neighbor, Ms. Edna. I want to feel her arm around my waist, which is something she used to do like she would see me coming and she would just like put her arm around my waist and I can't do any of that. It's like all this information and all this rage and sorrow and all this fear and all this jubilation. And there's just like so little touch to ground me. Um, I mean, my partner and my cats are amazing. Like I love a good lesbian uh, cat pile on like nobody's business. But um, I'm kind of a lot. And also, uh, I didn't used to like being touched. But now I like it a lot. And I make a point of doing it. I hold people's hands. I hug strangers at my readings and talks. And sometimes, like, even just out of the blue. Um, I mean, you almost, I think you probably know that moment, right? Like, something surprising and great happens, happened in the past. <laughs> and you're in a crowd. And all of a sudden, like, you're just, like, hugging each other. like. Um, at Pride or at, um, at a concert, at a ball game, like 
when you never thought your team would win. It's like in um, 2004, when I had had a nervous breakdown and uh, I'd done a really good job, like I'd done a super good job of not killing myself. And I finally said to my therapist, because I had done that work in private, that fear, I had said, um, I am scared of how many knives there are in the house and I'm scared I might touch myself with one of those knives. And I specifically said touch uh, instead of cut because I was really convinced that if I said I was gonna cut myself with one of those knives, then she was gonna call the EMT and then I was gonna be grabbed and I was gonna be taken away and I was gonna be put in the hospital like my mother had been and my mother had killed herself anyway. And I was just, I was so scared. But instead she, she looked at me and she said, like, this was real, like Jungian analyst, Berkeley style, you know, long flowing caftan, whole thing. And she just said, like, I'm really glad you told me that. And I said, I was in the fetal position on the couch, my usual position, like holding the pillow. Uh, and I said, uh, aren't you gonna, aren't you gonna have them take me away? I don't know who them was, like these huge EMTs I thought were coming. And she said, no, like, I think you're okay. I think you can go home for the weekend. I think a lot of people think about killing themselves and you could call me during this weekend, um, but I think you're gonna be okay. And um, to be clear, I was a mess, but like in that way, I was gonna be okay. And that was such a revelation to me, you know? I don't know if other people who are listening have had that, like, especially if there are people here who have had a parent or a sibling or just someone they love take their life, that gate is kind of always open. I didn't think I was allowed to think about doing those things, but I thought about doing them all the time. And that you could say to someone that you were thinking about wanting to die and not get like grabbed and taken away. I just remember lying on that couch. And then as I walked out, she like put her hand on my shoulder for a second. And it was like, that was like everything to me. Cause I was gonna be okay. I just needed to finally say that part of me was scared and I wanted to die, but also like, I was gonna, I was gonna make it through that weekend. That year, 2004 was really hard. I made a rule for myself. Um, I had to walk out of my house once each day this was in Berkeley, I had to walk to College Avenue. And before I could turn back and go home, I needed to look at three strangers in the eye and say hello. If I needed to sit on the curb and cry, that was cool. I needed to do that a lot. If I needed to sit on the ground in the shade of like, there was this giant rosemary bush. I also learned while I was having a nervous breakdown that rosemary bushes could be like six feet tall. Um, like if I needed to sit down and shake and like let like the rosemary bush kind of like grab my head with its like little pointy, beautiful, herby, herbaceous fingers that like that was cool. I could do that for an hour if I needed to. It was just about like letting the world touch me. And it was just about like letting myself touch the living world. And it was back and forth like that for a year, day to day, like smiling, um, making eye contact shaking hands. I don't know if other people have done things like this. That was hard then. Well, like my knuckle and the knuckle of the fruit vendors, like touching as like, we look, we like held an apple together or he like showed me a plum. That was progress. Like that was being alive. And going to the bookstore, uh, running and hugging the bookseller, Marianne at Mrs. Dalloway's, going to the tea shop or like I would go, if I was able to make it to the main college street, I could go to the Chinese restaurant and I could sit and like watch other people like interacting and eating dumplings and like smiling and uh, not wanting to die or like maybe wanting to die, but still eating their dumplings. And I felt like we were all really brave. Like, I feel like we're all being really brave right now, like in the midst of this, and then like at the end of that year, <laughs> the Red Sox won the World Series. I, I know like there are people who can't even, I don't have time to explain to anyone who doesn't understand or who hates them because of the Yankees or also like I don't watch them anymore 
for reasons I can't like totally get into except racism and history and um, anyway, leaving part of my old life behind. But that night that they won the World Series, um, I had to go to a poetry reading that night. Oh my God, I was so upset. And um, so I got a little radio and I got a set of headphones. I can feel it now, like touching myself. And my friend Peter, who was also a lifelong fan, sat next to me at the reading and we each took an earbud. I can feel us both doing it. And like, we put an earbud in our each of our ears. Um, so we were like, we were like some two headed like chowder bowl of hope, like just like sitting at Stanford University in this giant hall, just like this like kind of connected touching our shoulders touching. And when they won, which was like in the middle of a poem, <laughs> we just turned to each other. And we like were weeping silently. And we just like grabbed each other. Like we just like, we were then like, and we were also like a, a two headed chowder bowl of like, tragio comic like greek faces because we were like sobbing silently and like laughing and then the the poem ended that that poet's poem ended and i realized that other people had been doing the exact same thing because the entire like not the entire audience but like everybody clapped but like half of the audience like lost their minds and these poems were exceptionally good but they were not that good like this was like this was people holding in a whole lifetime of you know and people just hugging each other like people just and we can't do any of that now right like and i wonder i woke up this morning and i wondered like how am i gonna survive if i end up crying on the curb again like with all the knives in the house looking at me and yet uh like this past sunday on father's day my neighbor Ms. edna and her nine children brought her 93 year old father down the stairs of their front porch. He was so, they were decked out and he was super decked out. Like he had his black suit, his white Ken Gold cap, he had his wheelchair. There were balloons like festooned all over it. Um, beside him, they had blown up an enormous picture of his 13 children. They put it on an easel. So like people could drive by and see it and honk their horns. And then all of a sudden, Ms. Edna and eight of her kids all got in their separate cars, hopped in their cars and started driving around the block, round the block, round the block, round the block, beeping, honking, like yelling at him, like saying like, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you. And he was cracking up and the uh, one of the children who wasn't in the cars was like videotaping it. And so I ran out. I was like, Angeline, we're going to get in the car. We're going to join the car parade. So I ran out just as they were pulling up and they were stopping. And they were all getting out of their cars and they were laughing so hard and like touching each other. And like, and then I said, I was going to get in that car. I was going to join the car parade, which they loved. And they were cracking up. We were all laughing. And then as they like turned back to their lives, Ms. Edna's granddaughter, who's like six or seven years old, all of a sudden I looked and she was like, I don't know if I can back up. She was just like running towards me with her arms open and like, I, I had never been hugged by her and I have not been hugged by anyone other than my partner and my uh, slightly uh, confused cat um, for like three months now. And it was like time stopped. Like it was like time stopped and also, and there was this kid like coming towards me and I was like, do I tell her no? Like do I, the pandemic, right? Like, do I tell her no? Do I say stop? Do I put my hand out? And instead I just like, I don't know, I was like, I was in Berkeley again, like just trying to make it to the street. And I just, I just decided to like, I just decided to let the world touch me. This is not me saying people should not be wearing masks and all that. As far as the New York Times says, I think a tiny person hugging me is safe. But beyond that, it was the most amazing feeling to like, I've never felt, had that feeling in my life. I've been hugged a lot. I've been hit a lot. <laughs> I've been made to, Feel like I wasn't going to live another day, but I have never been touched like that. Nothing has ever entered me like that. That feeling of her throwing her arms around me and me putting my arms on her shoulders and standing there for like two seconds. She's a little kid and then she ran back to her life, you know. I was supposed to start this, um, I was supposed to start my story talking about the fact that this neighborhood also has 
like an ice cream SUV, like some entrepreneur has started an ice cream SUV that then they've turned into a van and how like when the pandemic ends, I'm going to hang off of that thing. I'm going to run after it like a chihuahua, then I'm going to hang on it and then I'm just going to reach in and touch hands and like get push pops. But I think I'll just end on that hug because I want you all to have that hug. I want us all to like, what is it to have like the child of the world, just all just that energy, just like if we could just get to hug each other. And so maybe what I'll say is um, I really hope to see you when all this is over. And I hope maybe you'll come to Durham, North Carolina and we can eat some push pops together and we can all hug. Thanks so much.